Hi everyone and welcome to episode number four of the Deb Talks podcast. Hi there everyone, thank you for tuning in to episode number four of the Deb Talks podcast. It's been a while, I'm sorry, uh, you know, things just get busy, but I am back today and today's topic of the podcast is death. Yep, something that no one really likes to think about, to be honest. We're, you know, just trying to get through our lives one day at a time and you don't really want to think about the end. Um, But today we are thinking about the end and I am lucky to be joined by two very amazing and inspirational women in my mind, Rena Lazar and Michelle Pante. And Rena and Michelle co-founded an organisation called Willow. And with Will, their goal is to transform the overwhelming and very fragmented process of advanced planning and they help people turn it into um, like a rich opportunity for their personal growth and their transformation. So these ladies are talking about death day in and day out. And believe me, I've been to one of their workshops. It's incredibly educational. And I'll admit that since coming across their business and listening to a lot of what they're saying I have been thinking about death a lot more and it really has got me thinking about my life and you know if my life kind of works for me right now so without further ado I'm going to dive right into the conversation I really hope that you enjoy this and again if you have any comments at the end or questions you can always post it below this episode in our comments box thanks for listening enjoy So welcome ladies, thank you for coming on to the podcast, it's exciting to have you. Nice to be here, thanks for having us. So would you like to do a little introduction of yourselves? I've talked, I've done a pre-introduction on Willow, but um, yeah, I'd love them to know individually who you are. What about us, do you want to know? Anything, everything. (laughs) Oh dear. (laughs) Anything you want to say, (laughs) Rina. Michelle's going first. I'll go first. Because <laughs> Rena, I just do what she tells me to do. Um, my name's Michelle, and uh, I am, not that you care how old I am, but I just feel like telling you because that's a big deal. I'm almost sure. 50. I'm turning 50 soon. And I uh, am loving the life that we've created. I am mama to an 11-year-old girl, and... Um, co-parent her with my husband and I'm also actively involved in um, helping my mom and dad who are elders live um, the best life they can live with where they're at um, and my dad not, not at all my dad is 82 and pretty well for 82 um, my mom is younger and has very advanced dementia so for four years now she's lived in a care home and um, yeah so my role I was just reading an article there's a business in Vancouver issue out right now about um, women in business and there was this section I was surprised to see it like just as one little section I'm like isn't this so many people who are women who are they call them you know the sandwich generation it's like yes but then to be a sandwich entrepreneur is a whole other thing Mm -hmm. so and let me just think of one thing I do outside of Willow that might be yeah. interesting. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> I can't think of anything. And Willow is everything. <laughs> what comes to my mind is just like sort of deep connections with, with women friends. So making time to connect with um, women in my life who are mostly also entrepreneurs. Awesome. And I'm just going to quickly interject that um, as an entrepreneur myself, I was at a business summit, the small BC business summit a little while ago, and I got funding through for my virtual assistant business through an organization called Futurepreneur, but they only do loans for women, uh, well, entrepreneurs who are between 19 and 39. And someone actually made the comment that, you know, women and men in the 50 something age group, there's a huge percentage now becoming entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. So it was just, 
and saying that, you know, they weren't funded through this program, but it is really growing for people, you know, I guess in the sandwich generation, a lot Mm -hmm. of them are becoming entrepreneurs themselves. Interesting fact. I was hoping you'd say that when you're over 39, they just give you money. That would be great. (laughs) It's not a loan. (laughs) (laughs) They just pay you. They just give you money. (laughs) Wouldn't that be nice? (laughs) Rina, over to you. Over to me. Rina, who's over 50. Woohoo. You do not look at either of you, just okay. saying. So I'm 53 and a half, but who's counting? <laughs> and uh, I have a 13-year-old uh, daughter who I co-parent with my, with her dad, who's from whom I'm separated, so she's with me half-time. And um, yeah, this is the first, I guess, serious for-profit business that I've started. I have started non-for-profits and I've done little, you know, little sort of on the side, little for-profit things, but never anything like this. And so it's very exciting. Very, very exciting. I love it. Um, I, my parents are both deceased. I'm getting there. <laughs> Michelle's giving me a, a clue of what I could say next. Yeah. Um, so my parents both died uh, approximately 15 years ago, at close in time to each other, about five months apart. And so I'm not at the sandwich place. I'm in a different place. Um, what I do for fun outside of Piece It Together is I swing dance. Woo-hoo. Ooh, nice. You mentioned <laughs> it's this. It's actually thing. Lindy Hop in particular. It's a kind of swing dance that's kind of the original swing dance. Oh, wow. I didn't know there was an original swing dance. Well, like from the days of the... 40s and 50s in Harlem, yeah. Cool. Yeah. This is why I do this podcast for all these <laughs> interesting facts. <laughs> and I realized that when you asked about for a little self introduction, I just went immediately to the personal in terms of like family setup and everything. Okay. But um, clearly, each of us could say more about where we come from in terms of our world of work or training, that sort of thing. So okay. we'll let you ask if you well, want yeah, to know that. Yeah, we're going to get into that. All right. So, don't worry. I, so I, I like the, the personal touch, though. It's nice to have that first, first and foremost. But yeah, so Willow is mostly the reason we're here, although obviously individually you're both very amazing people who have great lives outside of Willow. But tell me, why did you start? this company you know I this is Rena, and I'm gonna talk first but really Michelle should speak about this first because part of the reason I started or a big part of the reason I started was because of Michelle <laughs> <laughs> um what she's asking me something I don't know I could go you go want. no no it's fine it's fine I'll, I'll, I'll do it I'll go first so when I finished my previous um project which was running starting and running a nonprofit peace building program for 11 years it was winding down I was thinking okay what am I going to do next and I knew that I wanted to do something entrepreneurial I knew it that I wanted to be a for-profit because it was time and uh, I was thinking of different people I knew who were doing interesting things and I had remembered having a conversation with Michelle some years prior about her starting um, to study to be a funeral director. Now, I never knew anyone in my life who was studying to be a funeral <laughs> director. And so I was like, what? What, what, what are you doing that for? <laughs> and so she ta- told me all about what she was passionate about. And it was not about being a conventional funeral director at all. It was about the whole do- DIY movement, otherwise known as home funerals. It was also about the whole green burial movement and other green greening of de- death in general, and I was sitting in a restaurant across from her and I was leaning forward the whole time, because I was so, it was just so interesting. And uh, I couldn't say at that moment why I was so intrigued and, um, what do you call it, like attracted and called to it, but I was. So then I approached her when my other organization was winding down, said, hey, Michelle, so what are you doing now? And maybe we should start something together. (laughs) And I think I'll let Michelle tell you the rest. Um, So I could take it from there, or I can go back to what led me on the path to becoming a funeral director. Let's take it from there, but then I'm going to go back to that, because that's definitely a question I have. So when Rena approached me, I was actually not working as a funeral director. I was working in communications and kind of management consulting with a small boutique landscape architecture company in town, and one of their specialties was um, on a global scale, cemetery planning and design, and in particular, uh, sustainability and cemetery planning, design, and business analysis. So looking at 
what's involved in implementing um, green burial, how do we have cemeteries that are more sustainable and available to meet people's needs in the long run. And they were great people. It's a local company called Leeds and Associates. And um, I was, uh, I basically I recruited them to hire me. <laughs> they didn't have a job <laughs> and I convinced them that they should hire me. And um, they agreed. And um, I really was wanted to work with good people who were doing great things in the world. And, um, and thankfully I was able to find this excellent match. And um, I had stepped away from funeral services because uh, I think, you know, combination of things, but I was really burnt out. It's a very hard road. Mm -hmm. It's not like a typical trade where, you know, if you're going to become a carpenter, my understanding is you do something like, you know, you go to school for six weeks, you work for three months, you go to school for six weeks, you work for three months, and it's a cycle. In funeral services, you work full time and you have your courses simultaneously. And then as a mom to uh, a little, yeah. little person and my parents' health needs, and basically what I was experiencing in the funeral home um, was really dissatisfying. And I just thought, I don't want to keep doing this on the entrepreneurial drive that I had had when I began, because I did imagine creating my own socially responsible funeral venture. Mm -hmm. um, that entrepreneurial energy was just in the toilet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So when Rena asked me if I wanted to start something, I was like, really? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> but she was very patient and we met for about a year once every couple of weeks and just talked about all the different things that we were aware of or curious about in this realm our perception of people's needs and um, after about a year of meeting regularly um, we felt we had something that we could launch and um, I left my job and here we are wow <laughs> I mean that's patience one year of kind of building I guess or just putting down the foundation exploring really it, it, it wasn't, wasn't, it even, wasn't, even, it wasn't even building it was brainstorming yeah it was brainstorming for you yeah it took yeah. I think from I think we started brainstorming in like November or so and um and I didn't leave my job till the next September okay. and we didn't get clear about like a minimum viable product that we could launch until kind of the, the few months after that and then it was from September leaving the job till April of the following year that when we launched our website. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, I mean, you really took a leap of faith, right? And I mean, as an entrepreneur, I know how frightening that mm -hmm. really is. And you weren't working, Rina, or your organization had kind of wrapped mm -hmm. up I think at that point? I, it's hard to say. I was doing, like, I was getting paid, I believe, to do the wrapping up. So mm -hmm. I had a little bit of, like, a part-time some part time work. Okay, going yeah. on. Yeah. Wow. And then you just went yeah. right into it. Yeah. So I mean, you didn't come from and I'm still looking at you, Rena, you didn't really come from a background that or a job, I guess, that kind of did explore death or had any kind of relation to death. Certainly not directly. Not directly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um my background was in conflict resolution mm. and communication, although mostly what I did is I was the executive director of this small organization. So uh, but but I got into that whole field of peace building, peace mm -hmm. work because of my interest in communication and conflict resolution. Now, when you're talking with people who are facing the end, thinking about the end of their life, there's a lot of conflict resolution can come in quite handy and certainly good communication skills are important. Also, I mean, the work I did in the past was related to a real conflict, which so of course life and death yeah. were always floating. Yeah. Um, but not in the same way that we're doing it now. No different, for sure. And you also had this thread of work that involves sustainability. That's right. So, yeah, even before that, I was involved in, like, urban sustainable development stuff. So I was okay. very much interested in the green side. And then um, I think I was going to say one more thing. I forget what it is. It will come back. Mm -hmm. Just feel free to jump in mm -hmm. when it comes back. So with Willow, mm -hmm. it's now created. How long have you been... In the Willow world now, is that... It's just over a year and a half. A year and a half? Yeah. Okay. And what's your goals? I know it's probably changed a lot in a year and a half. <laughs> well, no, that was better. Where are you now? <laughs> Where yeah. are your goals now? So I guess it depends on the time frame, yeah. but sort of 
big, bold vision. Mm -hmm. um, our goals is that Willow is a brand that people know about throughout the English-speaking world, that we have a global licensing program so that there are people who are delivering our programs on mm -hmm. the ground in their co local communities yeah. throughout, again, the English-speaking world. So offering workshops, providing coaching, um, reselling our products, that we are, have a goal to have a, um, a menu of um, online products that people can sell from virtual learning opportunities to workbooks. You mean buy? To buy, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> we sell, they, they buy. buy. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. we have a, a, a big list of stuff. And in the scope of that, we want to change the world. Like we want to, we, this is um, really a mission-driven business. We are social entrepreneurs. Our, um, we're driven by a passion to make a difference in this realm that has not received a lot of attention mm -hmm. from people with this passion for making a difference um, and we want to do that and create right livelihoods so we can have some financial freedom in our lives yeah and I will add to that in the realm of things that people don't want to talk about like we definitely everything Michelle said yes and we want to make a difference in the way people think about their own life which includes death mm -hmm. because what we know both from ourselves and from pretty much everyone we've worked with is that when people really do contemplate consciously the, their mortality, the fact that they are going to die, that their life is finite, it enriches, it empowers, it motivates, it alivens people. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think it will, it, it also, as we're seeing from some recent examples in our life, it changes how people die. Yes. Mm -hmm. And when, and you know, what happens to the person who is dying um, and then dead and what happens to them after they're dead impacts a community of people around them. So it's this real um, nexus of yeah. opportunity. And can you give us, an, uh, would you be okay sharing an example of someone that you know who's you know, gone through that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the obvious. Yeah. So a, f a dear, dear friend of ours died uh, about a month ago. Um, Actually, a month ago tomorrow, month by ago the tomorrow. date. Yeah. yeah. And um, he, in, it's funny, I've just, the blog that we're just writing mm -hmm. right now is about him. And it's not the first time we've written about him because he's kind of Willow's poster child. His name is Don Grayston. And he, uh, he coined the term departure directions, which is one of the products and uh, one of, sorry, it's one of the workshops we offer. Mm -hmm. When he came to Michelle, we're both, we both happen to be friends with him independently. Uh, he came to Michelle a cup two, three years ago with this bunch of pages of stuff he put together about how he wanted to be cared for after he died. And he asked Michelle, knowing that she was either at the time. I was at the time. So it was actually more like six years ago. Oh, okay. six, uh, six, five or six years Studying ago. Studying to be a, a funeral director at the time and, and wanted her to review it. And he said, these are my departure directions. And we're like, I mean, <laughs> which of course later on we coined in with his permission. Um, so he, his plan at the time was to be cremated uh, because he thought that that was the most environmentally sensitive way he could go. Mm -hmm. He was also concerned about cost. And he also had a, lo a lot of other instructions about his funeral and stuff like that, which we can tell you a bit more about later. And um, some years later, the, uh, Michelle being very involved with the Green Burial Society of uh, Canada, this, so this Green Burial Society, which is a lot of the people who started are here in Vancouver, they were hosting an event, an educational event, and she said to Don, come on, Don, I think you're going to be interested in this. you got to come to this. And so he did. And by the end of it, he was so convinced that green burial was for him and discovered that because his father and grandfather had been buried in the municipal cemetery of Vancouver, Mountain View Cemetery, mm -hmm. over 40 years ago, that he can reuse the same plot, wow. Me meaning, meaning from a for first feel spiritually and, and meaningful very very meaningful he actually lives fairly lived very close to that to that cemetery but also it, this the plot's been paid for <laughs> so oh, wow. yeah. Yeah. so there's you know there's no there's opening and closing costs but it's very yeah. minimal so that is exactly what he changed in his departure directions he died a month ago he had possibly the most moving funeral i have ever been to in my life yeah. um 
and it's uh, what do I call it? It's it's still vibrating within me. Uh, what went on there and the, the things people said about him and that he lived his he he died the way he lived with so much um, integrity, so much beauty, so much love and. It wasn't didn't happen by a coincidence. It happened because he put his departure directions together. And I wanted you to tell him a bit about the um, heart will. Okay, but before the heart will, yeah. so remind me of the heart will. Uh, just a few other pieces about his mm -hmm. journey that illustrate what's possible when people have an, an openness to conversation, to learning, and they want to be thoughtful and they access su support. Mm -hmm. uh, so Don. He was. He had a um, an unexpected uh, hospital stay last December or oh, January, right. and he actually uh, didn't think he was going to leave the hospital alive, and he did. And upon his return home, he um, reached out to his community of friends and and with his family's support, and he invited people to come sit with him and be with him, be in friendship in a new way. And for two shifts a day, two four-hour shifts a day, he had a member of his community be with him. His son moved in and was sort of, you know, the on-duty yeah. uh, help. But then people came from one to four and from four to eight. And um, just were together in, in, in friendship in a new way. And that involved conversations about what was happening to him. And he was really clear that he expected that, you know, he, he was given like a few months to live. Um, and along the way, you know, so Don's departure directions, his, uh, he uh, is a retired priest and retired humanities professor. So oh, wow. he had a very large um, and diverse community of people and a real yeah. activist. He started many social justice organizations. He had explicit directions about what he wanted his funeral service to look like. But he also, ahead of time, because he wanted to lighten his footprint, he chose to, um, and he was having a green burial at Mountain View, he chose to be, um, have his body wrapped in a shroud and placed in a simple pine box. Um, he had, after he died, his family, uh, he also died in hospice, mm -hmm. um, his family and close friends came together um, at a location um, owned and operated by a, a local, what we would term progressive funeral provider. That's Koru Cremation Burial and Ceremony, korucremation.com. And they actually, um, I guess, uh, as an act of love, you know, ceremonially in a way, he had been bathed prior to coming there, but they, they washed him, they dressed him, they got to be with him. That was not part of his original plan. That came about through conversations. And his family, except for his sister, were not actually, they hadn't been living life thinking, oh, when dad dies, we really want to be there to yeah. do that. But when given the opportunity to choose to be present and to participate as they might like to, not expected, like you have to do this, but with the support of the funeral director, um, they chose to, to be involved in that. and. You know, I we weren't there, but we heard it was amazing for them and really meaningful. Um, and the part of what made Don's service so amazing were the the people who spoke had been asked um, ahead of time. They've been told, you know, Don wants you to be one of the people to offer remembrances. So there was, um, you know. People were able to just inter begin to integrate the loss of this man in their lives without a lot of flurry of activity and panic and surprise because things have been open, the conversation had been flowing. Yeah, and it was, I guess, fairly organized then in that case, because yeah. I know, well, I imagine, you know, you lose someone and it's, as you said, panic, fear, not sure where to start what mm -hmm. to do, mm -hmm. but yet he had set out his yeah. directions, which mm -hmm. is, yeah, really beautiful. Um, and the other thing he did is he wrote a heart will. A uh, heart will is also, it's, it's a word that we've kind of made up, but it could also be an ethical will or a spirit will, sp ethical letter, spirit letter. Um, legacy letter. Legacy letter, that's mm -hmm. the word. And um, not long before he died, uh, we in our visits with him, asked him, Don, so did you, because he, he would, he was talking about writing a heart will, but he hadn't done it. And then it was, it was me. I had this conversation with him and he said, well, 
we kind of sat and talked about it, and he realized that he had written some things down um, some years back that were kind of lessons he learned about life at his, the, um, was it the 50th anniversary of his ordination? ordination yeah. And he thought, you know, I'm going to revisit that. So he did. He went and he revisited that, and he edited it down, and he, you know, made a new introduction and everything, and he said, okay, this is it. And he sent it to Michelle and I. <laughs> this is it. I've got the heart well. So then we thought, okay, well, we have no idea what he wants to do with it. So I, seriously, a week before he died, because um, that was the last time I saw him, I said, oh, by the way, Don, what do you want to do with your heart well? He goes, well, I sent it to you. I said, I know, but what, <laughs> do, what do you want? Thank you, and it's great. And what would you like to do? He goes, oh, well, I want it printed out and handed out to everyone at my funeral. I'm like, I'm oh, glad I asked. <laughs> yeah. So the reason we even asked him about a heart was we have, a curriculum that we developed mm -hmm. called Legacy Love Letters and Heart Wills. And it's about people identifying who and what matters most to them and writing lasting messages mm -hmm. that can be for um, distribution at the time of death. You might choose to share them before that or they're left for future generations and as a, yeah. as a legacy. And they, are, they can be very, very diverse, as unique as the people who write them. And Don's took the form of um, you know, eight insights he had. And it is so, like, the, I, you know, we're reflecting on this today because we're choosing to write about this, that when I think about, you know, missing him and kind of wanting to hear his voice and have him kind of, you know, reverberate in my being yeah. and turn to him for counsel, I now have this very tangible, concrete thing I can look at, yeah. and it also lives online with his obituary, that tells me, gives me insight and it, and it really, um, it's very comforting to think like I'm not going to lose, you know, what would Don say? Yeah. I mean, he's, yes, he's dead. He's not here anymore. His funeral was spectacular in the best of ways. And it, there, you know, there's some searing memories from that, mm -hmm. but I imagine, you know, in time that too will fade to a degree, but the heart wheel is there. It's in black yeah. and white. And yeah. I can always turn to that. So it's very special to have that. Yeah. yeah. And it, it was actually handed out to everyone at the funeral. There were about 500 people at his funeral. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And like I said, it also lives online. And it's, for some people, they, like, th these are beautiful, eight beautiful sort of life lessons that could have, a, like, a life-changing impact on the people who read them. Like, yeah. it could be that, you know, it's that simple. And yet, you know, I was, I was thinking that, I mean, I'm so so grateful that I've had him as a friend in my life, and and yet in some ways his ceremony, his his ritual of death, his funeral, and combined with the physical you know letter he left behind, in some ways like those things might impact me in the long run the most because it's yeah. like they're they're just so deep and meaningful and they're enduring. I mean, so it's you know. Yeah, no, I mean, it's beautiful. I have read, obviously, the blog posts about Don that you have already yeah. on your blog. And I'll post those in the show notes so that people can refer to them after they listen to this. And then the next blog post, which will be out probably just before this podcast gets okay. out. Yeah, I will tomorrow also, night. <laughs> yeah, tomorrow. Mm. I will I'll, I'll post a link to that too. Because, I mean, it has been fascinating for me just to kind of read your yeah. posts yeah. about this person. And yeah. as someone, you know, I'm only 35 ladies, sorry, mm -hmm. I know you guys are <laughs> the 50 mark or over. Um, but watching the work that you do and reading these blog posts have, has even affected me oh. in the way that, you know, I'm now putting together information for my family. Should mm -hmm. something ever happen to me, this is who you contact. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, planning to write a will and get in a power of attorney. and We have a that, referral. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, just all those things that, okay, yeah, I'm young. Hopefully it doesn't happen for a long time, but you never know. Exactly. Right? Life never is know. a mystery. Mm -hmm. We do not know when we're going to die, how we're going to die, yeah. and we can have fantasies about that, and those are helpful. They can inform us. Yeah in identifying what really matters to us and it's good to capture that um, but life is unpredictable and we just had we were uh, reminding people we have a workshop tomorrow night at um, anyway tomorrow night and um, one of the people who's on the list who said she's coming we got an email back from her written her email but from a friend who's also come to our session saying um, you know Mary was actually hit by a car on Sunday night, and she's okay. yeah, you didn't read that. <laughs> didn't come? Okay, Mary was hit by a car. She's thankfully alive, but she's in a lot of pain, and she's um, hurting. 
And so our our work is having even, I said, you know, well, you know, mm -hmm. let us know how we can help. And should I not, should, I thought I'd keep her on the list so she can refer to the emails mm -hmm. over time when she's ready. But I could stop if they wanted. They're like, no, please keep her on the list. Your work is even more meaningful to her now. Yeah. That could happen to any of us. Yeah. I could get hit by a bus on the way home, walking yeah. to the SkyTrain. We don't know. So um, there is great relief in getting your stuff together. Definitely, definitely. And even like small things I think about is if I'm leaving the house and, you know, or my boyfriend's leaving, yeah. I always say to him now, never leave without kissing me or never <laughs> leave without just because, you know, I'm yeah. sure it'll be fine. I'm going to yeah. think positive, yeah. but yeah. anything can happen, right? And it doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are, you got to get your stuff together. Yeah. So it'll just make it a lot easier. There's the ease for the others, but there's the and it's the certain peace of mind for yourself, but I want to say it's more than peace of mind. It's more like just peace. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, and it also like it changes the way you live. Yeah. When you think about the fact that you're going to die, it changes the way you live. It makes you more grateful. It makes you more um, energetic. Makes you more loving. Yeah, I mean, you guys have that term, the reality of your mortality, mm -hmm. which I love, mm -hmm. um, because it's so true when you start thinking about your death. And I know this is kind of, you know, one of the goals, the premises of your mm -hmm. organization is that you will live, hopefully, a more inspired life. We're, I, it's not, it's it, so, okay, we're a year and a half in. And, you know, maybe someone's going to prove us wrong. <laughs> but it's not a hope. It's a reality. It's what it's happens. A yeah. It's a promise. People tell us. We, we changed our tagline. Yeah. Our tagline is enrich, energize, and connect with end-of-life planning. Because that's what people told us. You know, I, review, I we had an exercise where people are, you know, asking each other these questions. They're like six simple questions. We call them heart will warm-up questions. Mm -hmm. Or we have departure direction warm-up questions. They turn to a stranger. They answer this question. Yeah. And they listen and they say at the end, I can't believe how connected I feel. You know, I didn't even know yeah. this person before. I feel energized. I feel lighter. I feel excited. Yeah. And people who haven't been wouldn't believe that, which is partly what led us to change our business model. Yeah. Because people are not prepared to pay uh, with a name. You know, we're not very well known, relatively speaking. Yet. And yet. yet. And people don't know. They don't get what they're going to get. Mm -hmm. So, um, like I say, I'm going to have to pay to talk about death. I don't even want to talk about death. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, end of life planning. Like, I'm, I, you know, my life has just begun. <laughs> and, you know, the other thing I think th that is a part of why we're, we've been, you know, had s this kind of success so far is that we're not saying come talk. I mean, we do have this one workshop that's called the reality of your mortality uh, learning circle, but that's primarily for people who've done some of the other works, but not only, it's for anybody. A lot of people come to us with the idea of like, oh, I'm going to go there because I want to write a heart will or, mm -hmm. and love letters. Oh, I want to do, I really want to get my departure directions done. Like it's something practical and pragmatic that they want to get done. And they, they feel like, okay, I can get, I can get my head around that. I can get my psyche around that. And that might be the motivating factor, but our workshops and our material is, um, what weaves through it all is really consciously contemplating your mortality. How do you feel about it? Um, what does it mean to you? What's important to you? Who and what matter most? And so they might come for the pragmatic, but they leave with the profound. Profound, yes. Mm. Good, good. Yeah. Yes. That's another term. You there you go. I know. I just, we just made it up. Right from, from the pragmatic to the profound. So we've got it recorded. Oh, yeah, so okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that's amazing. So like, why do you think so many people don't want to talk about or face their death like what's from the experience you've heard from you know people who have taken your workshops mm -hmm. or you know done your coaching why is that such a block well i think some of the common responses to that are things like well it's morbid i don't want to talk about death because it's so morbid like it's mm -hmm. depressing i had a friend a friend slash acquaintance well a friend who asked me, she said, well, you know, I'm, I'm looking, I look at the work you're doing. Isn't it really depressing? And I'm like, I said to her, actually, it's quite the opposite. <laughs> it's really enlivening. It's really inspiring. It's very uplifting work. She, she, anyway, but she's never come to any of our workshops. Um, another reason that some people don't like to talk about it, they think that if you talk about it, it's bad luck. Like they really think oh. like, oh, if I talk, and, and if you plan for it, like if you actually write down how you want your funeral to go, 
is not like gonna make you die or something. <laughs> make it happen. Almost yeah. like the secret it's superstition. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is yeah. a superstition. Or it's like it, some people feel like if I don't think about it, it's not gonna happen. Look, guess what? <laughs> We're talking about death. <laughs> it's gonna happen. <laughs> there, so, so far. There's no way to not make it happen. Yeah, yeah. it's guaranteed yeah. pretty much. And I think there's a bit of a, a vicious circle at work in that we've basically hidden death away, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, historically, people died in their homes, were cared for by their family members or neighbors who maybe were more comfortable or experienced. Mm -hmm. They stayed at home. This is in, you know, say, a e European descendant, North America situation. Um, people s stayed at home until they went to their typically, you know, uh, organized religion service uh, or uh, were and were buried. And over time, that has shifted and mm -hmm. we have professionalized uh, death care, we have institutionalized those who are dying for in large part. So it's um, it's, I think it's out of our face because we don't want it in our face. And it's um, not in our kind of even lexicon because we don't We're see not, We don't want it. We don't see it. it. We're not used yeah. to it. Yeah. You know, you it's think foreign. about um, people who um, don't have any, and this is very common and was for me before I got into this world of work. People have no books, say, in their children's, in their family library that illustrate the cycle of life that yeah. oh, just talk about death and dying is everything di everything dies yeah you know we don't take the opportunity to kind of take the the literal example of what happens in nature and trans you know transcend that onto what happens to people like it's a natural part of the life cycle is death and we are afraid of it generally speaking, the dying and the death. And so we just keep it at bay. And then connected to that is grief and mourning, which I'd mm -hmm. say, you know, is probably in the closet even more. And, you know, I think it is something that you, um, I don't know if learn is the right word or train, but it's something like that. Because when I think of myself before I got into this world, um, I think of when my, my parents were dying, particularly my dad, he really wanted to talk about death. And even though I think Inside, I wanted to talk about it too. I just, I had no idea how. Mm -hmm. And I, I, there was a fear that was like, oh, I can't talk about death with a dying person. <laughs> like, yeah. And I remember the same thing happening with one of my cousins who died. Um, again, before I started this work, I had to say goodbye because she was, she was in a palliative care already and I was going on vacation. Said goodbye and I said something like, I hope I see you in, uh, when I get back, which is going to be a few weeks. She goes, well, you know why I'm here, right? <laughs> <laughs> like she's like uh, and basically she's trying to tell me you probably won't yeah. <laughs> and I'm like uh, yeah and I just couldn't say anything like, I didn't know it's like I didn't know how yeah. mm -hmm. and I mean if the, either of those situations were happening today like it would be a completely oh, yeah. because it's a, like I've become comfortable talking about death like I talked about death with Don before he died you know I talked about death with a few other people we, we've known who, who died and and what I realized is <laughs> They're much more comfortable than even I am, you know, the people who are actually dying. But yeah. I mean, now I don't think there's anything that I like I wouldn't want to ask or say. But at the time, and I think that's really common. I think it's probably what most people are like. It's just so foreign. We don't know how. Mm. It just feels odd. It's kind of like probably like, you know, a, a tween talking about sex education or something. Right. If you've never had sex. <laughs> yeah. and, and I was just thinking about making the parallel between sex ed and death ed. There have yeah. been some um, conversations that are on the radio and about initiatives where they're, they are looking at death education in schools. And I think that would be fabulous. So yeah. you just think where we're, we still have so many um, kind of boundaries and struggles and challenges around universal sex education and supporting people to explore and understand and engage in their sexual sexuality and being sexual beings. Right. Well, all the stuff around death and dying is like way behind that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you know, there are many cultures around the world that talking about death, celebrating the dead is an annual, if not mm -hmm. more, co more often um, occurrence. Uh, not only generally like a society like saying Mexico is a day of the dead, but T you know, bringing back grandma or grandpa and uh, 
but either either literally like the body or yeah. Yeah. or um, figuratively where you spend some time really focusing on someone who died or who yeah so that when someone does die it's it's natural <laughs> this is also related to things like um, you know industrialization right like people not living in communities or um, home-based environments where we kill our own um, food yeah, right? right we just don't yeah. see the yeah. cycle of life it's like we've before lost the us connection. Yeah. yeah it's very visceral and um, you know or living in in a community where people die often children babies like you know people don't necessarily die of old age they die from what we would think about as preventable illnesses and diseases or from malnutrition and poverty like death is just so much more in their face and you know when you look at nature uh, plants flowers people don't like to look at a dying plant or a dead flower like they don't see the beauty of it yeah when they actually are everything is really beautiful or if if people just want things to be a lot like just yeah <laughs> it's <laughs> like we all want eternal youth exactly right? which yeah. frightens me actually you know <laughs> I've had conversations um, with my partner who's in the film industry and, you know, there's lots of ways to make yourself continue to look really young. I don't necessarily think it looks that good, but that's my <laughs> personal opinion. I really love, you know, seeing wrinkles on people. I was so excited the other day because I found a grey hair and my boyfriend was like, you're the only person I know. <laughs> and I'm like... But that means wisdom. Like, I love that. I love yeah. seeing that. I want to be that lady with the long gray hair and the wise, exactly, <laughs> Michelle's pulling her hair out. And, like, you know, the wise wrinkles around their eyes because I think it's way more beautiful and it shows character and it shows you've lived your life and it, you're not trying to hang on to something. That's yeah, not, and we you know, see covered. We it. see yeah. some shifts, right, in our yeah. general culture around that. You know, I've just been seeing this woman on Facebook. I can't remember her name. I think it's Candy Joseph. She She's like a model in her 60s, right? And she has a, a line of products and, you know, um, more conversations about women in the entertainment industry who are really elders who mm -hmm. are um, maintaining their livelihood and their craft. And so there are shifts, but... Yeah. Yeah. No, I just... I think we had then gotten on to the conversation of, you know, eternal youth. And is that something, you know, maybe that people don't die ever? And, <clears throat> excuse me, I actually just thought, I don't like the idea of that. Like, I kind of like... I like the fact that something will come to an end because then... Well, firstly, God, could you imagine having to work all the time? I can't <laughs> wait to retire. So step number one, really excited for retirement, and I'm not even close yet. And then secondly, I think it will make me live the years that I have, you know, in a hopefully more inspirational way, in a way that I want. Whereas if I knew I had eternal life then, hey, what the hell? I'd probably just sit on my butt and watch Netflix. Yeah, lot. there's there's lots of quotes out there. We have one <laughs> on our... Um, in some of our materials that I think it goes something like life is precious kid because it ends mm -hmm. life is only precious kid because it ends. Yeah, yeah that's from Rick Riordan from son of Neptune so the finite nature of life is what makes it precious yeah exactly like like many other things yeah no that's beautiful um so I'd love to just kind of touch you've touched a little bit on some of the learning circles and workshops that you do you've currently got legacy love letters and heart wills running um you're what maybe part way through that or did it yeah about maybe a third ish the third one is tomorrow that. so the third one is tomorrow out and of six there will be more in december do you have some dates yes yeah, december, december 7th one? and 14th okay. so it's six thursday nights in a row from okay. 6 30 till 9 p.m at mountain view cemetery in the city of vancouver and um, they're free. People can come once. They can come to all of them. They, we ask them to register mm -hmm. at hello at willoweol.com. And then on November, Monday, November 27th, we have a workshop coming up. That's our reality of our mortality learning circle. Mm -hmm. um, and um, then we have a little bit of programming that we know about in the new year. Great. But that's um, still unfolding. Yeah, no, that's fine. Again, I'll link to that in the show notes so people can look up those dates. Because I know I've only made it to one of the workshops, but even just that one was... That's kind of where I got the 
the insight into, oh God, I need to give my parents information on what to do <laughs> if something happened to me. And I kind of stirred all that up. So, you know, just one of those workshops to me was powerful. So I can imagine, you know, attending every session mm. being even more per- uh, powerful. Um, so yeah, I'll post to that. Now, a couple of other just kind of funny questions to hopefully wrap us up um, that I'm curious about. Uh, do you guys believe in ghosts? Oh dear, that's not so funny. <laughs> I know. You know, all this talk of death, and I don't know why that question came to me earlier, but I was like, I wonder if they do. Mm-hmm. If you're willing to share, if not, that's yeah. all good. So to me, when you say, do I believe in ghosts? What I think about is, do I believe in kind of spirits? Mm. Um, so what's the difference in a ghost and a spirit? I don't really The ghosts know. Are, have a white sheet on. <laughs> <laughs> and like hollow eyes. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, for simplicity's sake, I'd say yes. And I, I, to me, I mean, I, and what I mean by that is I believe in the active presence of spirits, of people who've come, uh, gone before us. Yep. Nice. What about you, Mila? I probably have to say yes, too. And it's funny. I, it's like I don't, there, I'm just saying that makes me sort of uncomfortable because <laughs> it's like, am I coming out as a ghost believer? Um, <laughs> it's it's more like there's been too many times where I've uh, I felt something. Mm. It, it's not like a particular person giving me a particular message. It's just that I don't, you like, you know, even Einstein said energy can't be destroyed, yeah. right? So where does that energy go? Yeah. Has to go somewhere. It has to go somewhere. Um, I don't know how and it manifests exactly, but I think I think the energy of the people who are of people who have died is out there doing something. Mm-hmm. Something somewhere. <laughs> Stirring up trouble. <laughs> One of the questions that we pursue in departure directions is uh, asking people what they think happens to them mm-hmm. after they die. And one of the insights that um, resonated with me, and I think this is based on what some other people said, is, you know, because nobody can come back and tell us. Um, yeah, no one has. Yet. No one has yeah. come back to tell us what happens. Um, we can choose to believe whatever we want. We can believe whatever gives us comfort as well as provides comfort to those who we left behind. Mm-hmm. So I choose to believe that the love I feel for people who are still here on earth uh, will be felt by them and that I will continue to feel connected to them. So we will maintain a connection. I can't explain how or why, but that's yeah. what I believe because it gives me comfort and I think it comforts, for example, my daughter. Yeah, wow. I like that. And you've talked to your daughter yeah. about that, yeah? Amazing. Nice. Um, so and actually, another question I had was like, do you believe in an afterlife? But I guess you've just kind of answered that with that question. What about well, you? Well, the Anna? afterlife thing is a little different. It actually means that, uh, oh, and I was oh, sorry, I'm thinking when you said afterlife, I was thinking reincarnation in particular. That's different, totally different. Um, yeah, so she's sort of covered that with afterlife. What um, about reincarnation then? Since yeah. you brought it up. <laughs> um, I'm fascinated by reincarnation. I, ca- I can't. You know, and I've heard slash read stories of people who, you know, can practically prove <laughs> that they were <laughs> someone else in a past life by knowing things that no one else could possibly know. Like, it just, uh-huh. it fascinates me. And of course, there are certain traditions where uh, it's not even a question, like, yeah. right? You know, like the Dalai Lama is reincarnated, yeah. like from some of the, the, the previous Dalai Lama, like yeah. that's just all there is to it. So I just think it's too huge to ignore um, and yeah, I, all I can say is I'm, I'm just fascinated by it. Mm-hmm. I certainly don't have any strong memories of a past life or anything like that. Or, but um, yeah, yeah, some people do. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I honestly think I was a cat in a past yeah. life, but that's about <laughs> as close as I've gone. <laughs> Only because sometimes I really want attention, and other times <laughs> I'm like, get away from me. <laughs> um, <laughs> I know, and I can make the noise. Um, and I'm going to ask you something that, from one of the questions on your website, which I'm assuming you probably ask a lot, is if you only had, let's say, six weeks to live, what would you do? 
every time I ask, I'm asked that question or I think about that question, it's slightly different. Um, one time, about a, maybe it was a year ago, when I answered that question, if I had a limited time to live, what would I do? I thought, you know what? I want to go back to Israel and Palestine. I've been there many times for my past work, but never haven't been there as a sort of tourist for a long, long, long time. And I want to take my daughter, who's never been. And that's something I thought, I want to do that. And so it's actually going to happen in next March. Amazing. Yay, yay. Um, so that was one of the things. But it's it, generally speaking, if I had a limited time to live six weeks, it's very short. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, would, it would definitely all be about um, connections and relationships. Mm -hmm. More, You know, six weeks is, is, is uh, yeah. It would just all be about reconnecting with everyone that I've lost connection with and something I try to do anyway. And uh, just being as loving as I can. Wow. Thank you. What about you, Michelle? Um, so lots of similarities in terms of wanting to connect with people. Um, I also, um, I want at some point in my life, and so if I was lim had limited time to live, I would make it happen. I want to be involved in doing something very physical and hands-on. Um, I think mostly, like most importantly, around girls' education. Mm. So I would take, pack up my husband and my daughter and say, we're going to, I don't know where, name one of many countries in the world and find a community that was welcoming of assistance and, um, I don't know, help build a school or something yeah. like that. So I would do that for, I don't know, 10 days or something like that. And then I think, um, yeah, I imagine a piece of what I'd want to do is visit. My dad is from Italy and immigrated when he was in his 20s. And my mom is from Ireland mm -hmm. and also immigrated when she was in her 20s. And my husband's family um, on one side um, is from Iceland. Oh, and um, I would love to, I would bring, I would go with um, my husband and daughter to those countries. Nice. Yeah. And... And I'd want to spend some time by myself. Mm. Um, I'd want to, this makes me cry, uh, yeah. spend some time uh, kind of, I guess the words that come to mind are just like um, expressing gratitude to mm -hmm. the divine. You know, like I, I believe in God and I use the word God, but, um, you know, just the life force, the yeah. creator. Um, gods and goddesses that whatever works um, and just be present to the gift of life that I've been given yeah wow oh, powerful stuff ladies you're gonna cry it's Good. not it's cry. not um, complete unless she cries <laughs> <laughs> <Good to know. laughs> I love it well, thank you so much. You've given me, well, you know, since I've met you, which was probably almost a year ago, mm -hmm. a lot of that uh, food for thought, actually. So I really hope that people, our listeners, will also feel inspired. And uh, make sure to visit your website, willoweol.com. You can also sign up for the Heartwell Guide, free Heartwell Guide, if you sign up for the newsletter, which you can do through the website. You guys have lots of courses coming up, so check out their events page. And again, I'll link to all of this in the show notes. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm your virtual assistant, which is how I know you guys. So nothing to do with this podcast, but my other business. And I think um, one thing I'm very grateful for is a lot of my clients and you guys kind of lead the way in this is that you all have, have work that is making a difference in the mm -hmm. world and that's really you know to work for people who are doing that for me is huge um and then just being able to get to help you spread the word through this mm -hmm. has been great so uh more conversation about death everyone talk about yeah. it yeah and you know what your own death yeah. um <laughs> yeah. thanks for inviting us and just to be clear so that you know listeners who are kind of Re thinking about their own passions and mm -hmm. you know how they can bring that to life I mean really clearly one of the reasons we said yes to having you on our team was because it made a difference to you mm -hmm. that we're making a difference yeah so we want to work with um, people who are passionate about um, having a positive impact on the world so yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. It's an honor. Thank you, Thank ladies. you so much. It's been a joy. And um, obviously, I'm here for you anytime, but good luck. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you know, no. Take it out to the world. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Deb Talks, the podcast. We would love to hear from you. So feel free to leave your comments below. Or hey, if you really enjoyed this podcast, then would love it if you could rate us highly on iTunes. If you have any questions or even topic ideas for a future episode, then you can email me at info at debtalkstv.com. You can always keep up with us on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at DebTalksTV. And you can view our past video episodes on our website at DebTalksTV.com. We'll see you next time.